You obviously woke up this morning. You know, I don't know if you got yourself a gun. I'm not sure if your mom said that you were going to be the chosen one. Did your mom say you were going to be the chosen one? I was a kid of the 90s, of course, that my mom was the chosen one. You okay. Know? You, you every teacher, yeah, all the parents. Yeah. But let's tease what we're going to talk about. We're obviously hitting one specific topic, which is The Sopranos, one of the greatest shows ever. Agreed. Well, what is on your mind for this show? Um, I just wrote some pretty brief things down, you know? I figure we'd talk about the main things. Episodes, characters, themes, seasons, uh... Two of my favorite topics, the deaths, and uh, maybe like some uh, antagonists or like, you know, the bad guys. There's a lot. I mean, there's a lot of bad guys, but, you know, some of the more central bad guys. The bad, bad guys. This is one of those shows due to the anti-hero phenomenon that started the good bad guys, but there's also bad, bad guys. <laughs> Straight up bad guys. Straight up bad guys. And <laughs> bad guys you're not rooting for. We'll have to develop the nomenclature as we go through this. We'll come up with new lingo if need be. Anti-hero popularized the last 20 years, but... Yeah, Difficult Men, right? That's the Difficult Men. I love it. There's a book called Difficult Men I've been wanting to read, actually. <sighs> we'll see. But right now, let's, let's make books. Let's make podcasts. Let's, let's get there. Uh, people talked about Sopranos for 20 years. Straight so up. this is tough. I mean, in, oh, just to be clear, we're talking about the Sopranos, not talking, talking Sopranos. So this isn't the show... <laughs> With Michelle Imperioli yeah. and uh, Stefan Sharippa. Yeah, absolutely. To confuse anyone. We're talking about the actual HBO run of the television show. Which it's crazy that they're decided to do uh, episode by episode breakdown. Like, we're going to watch it together and go through the whole show. I was like, wow. And it's on, that's all on HBO too, which is unbelievable, you know? They finally succumbed to the uh, nostalgia culture we've been going through. Hey, Just COVID was heavy for everybody, right? Stick with the brand. Retrench in your place of strength. Absolutely. You also said that you drove over here. Matt Matt lives not too far away, but he had kind of like the Newark drive oh, on oh, the way it was, here. It was very surreal, you know. I'm, I'm in my in my my getup today, you know, and I'm I'm I turned on Dirty Work by Steely Dan because of course you do in that situation. And I'm driving into the city and I'm seeing all the city stuff, and I was like, wow, this is exceptionally surreal in this moment. You know, my my uh, Tony Tony Soprano cosplay, I guess I'm doing. Today. No cigar though, right? It's, no, I yeah. Okay. You know, I'm, I'm, Next time, next time. You, I, mean, well, I guess more Paulie Wallen less than Soprano. But you know, it's you know, it was it was just, just a real moment, you know, coming into the city and getting charged up for this, right? I also realize I should be talking with my hands. I'm trying, right? You I see, I'm now. trying. No, it's true. You actually helped me remember I'm what I need time. to be doing now in this moment. You know, <laughs> I wish I had a pinky <laughs> ring. If I had a pinky ring, pinky ring is like the exclamation point for an Italian man. It is. I feel like you do so much because you got the pinky. No, ring. you're you're. Don't criticize. You're exactly how you should be. You, you look great. The leather coat, it's amazing. It's, I put on some pinstripes. It's fresh. I feel like these mind. stripes are sort of like Sopranos he's, adjacent. He's a made man. He's got his stripes, you know? My new favorite thing now, by the way, is like anytime some you don't want to like directly uh, take responsibility for saying like, oh, this is an Italian sh shirt. I'm going to just start saying, like, oh, this is like Italian adjacent. <laughs> I'm just going to start saying like adjacent as adjacent. opposed to yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me on there. But let's get to some of the categories. What's sure. one of the first ones you want to get to in Sopranos land? I mean, I don't know, dude. It's There's so much to talk about. I feel like, you know, okay, let's just straight up. Like, who are some of the, what do you think of the best characters? Again, so I you've, I mean, like we've said, you've been in this for 15 plus years, you know? I feel like I'm a bit fresher I got to enough. this. It's, it's it's really 2000 or 2001. I was like in sixth grade That's when I first wild. saw this bad boy. So 22 years, actually. 15 is when it ended. Mm, yeah. So wow. it's been part of my formative years for much longer. Which was an inspiration for me wanting to finish it. I had watched parts of it uh, in college and I didn't finish it. And But knowing James, he's always said this is one of his favorite shows. And, you know, we get along. So I'm like, man, I got to put it back on the list. And so I finally did. And it's been... It's been, I'm upset it's taken me this long to get into it, honestly. It's fine, though. It's part of the show's nature. Yeah. I feel like I was more an AJ. Mm -hmm. I was like the child when mm -hmm. I first watched the show, and now yeah. I'm much closer to Tony's age. Oh. James Gandolfini was famously 37. 37. That was, a, that was an earth-shattering moment. During the pilot? In the Hard first season, I was the same age as me watching it. He's that. So uh, related to it on a much different level, like, you know, not that... The impossibility of that person being me at 37 and him being, you know what I mean? Just the differences of, of, you know, but still relating to his challenges of being a father and having kids and that, that whole, you know, uh, suburban life that he has, which is, I think, some of the best parts of the show is them living, right? Just like the silly moments of them being a family. I, I really enjoy that. On the um, family stuff, on like formerly being AJ, now feeling more like Tony, 
Um, I actually did not like AJ as a character when I first watched the show, and now I really have much more of an affinity for him because I, of course, said all of the dumbass things he said at some point between 2001 and 2023. It was definitely different. Um, I think uh, relating to him on a different level, right? Of like his his insecurities and his not knowing what to do and his vacillating. You know, I remember all that in my twenties. Like, I don't know what I want to do. I want to do this. I don't want to do that. You know what? Fuck it. I'm going to the military. Right? Like, like just like making a snap decision at that age. You know. Um, and then you know I you know it, yeah he, he AJ is I think one of the, one of the better characters as far as non mob related characters in the show. Right. It's almost unfair. Yeah. yeah. They don't put a gun in his hand. Right. No. Some of that stuff, it just amplifies the excitement. Absolutely. Actual favorite characters. First thing comes to mind, Polly Walnuts. Okay. He's just one of those characters. Yeah, of course. Specifically because he's not necessarily what the show relies upon, but he just comes in and he just nails hilarious moments. Absolutely. He gets violent when he needs to get violent. He has some of the details and nuance that an actual personality would have, which supposedly the writers used yep. in the show, like his germophobia. Mm-hmm. In some of his like tweaks with his his hair, right? He was really oh, he did his, his own hair, hair yes, yes. for the show, which I, again iconic, right? Like truly, like iconic, like but really, like uh, Pauly Walnuts. You know what he looks like? He peers in your head so quickly. You know, you know what you're gonna get with that guy, right? Like how do you how do you invent a hairstyle in 1999? That's insanely oof. impressive. Usually, hairstyles just recycle every 15 to 20 years. He actually is like, well, we're gonna do like a slick back thing, but I'm gonna use a coloration, <laughs> specific spots, uh, and then boom, he's got himself a famous haircut. <laughs> Let's see what I did there, Tone. See what I did? Yeah, he a Pauly Walnuts is one of my favorite characters. It's interesting for me because. As the show progresses, I like him less. He does more heinous things. So at the beginning, you know, him and his relationship with Christopher, um, you know, th- their their antagonistic relationship is funny. You know, it's like uh, Elmer Fudd and Bugs Bunny. But then it starts to get really a lot more intense as the show progresses, which I think is is cool. You know, where it's straight up, you know, it's, you know, he paralyzes the guy, right? He paralyzes... Um, Polly's cousin, right? Throws him out the window. Oh God, yeah. You know, so it's, I, it gets that, weird that relationship, you know. And uh, but Polly, you know, him, him abandoning his mother, you know, because he finds out, you know, like he just does some some pretty heinous things. Um, but I love how he is uh, the last man standing. You it's know? very yeah. Full spoilers. We're going into all of it. So if you haven't sorry seen guys, the show, yeah, twenty years old, so kind of eat it. But uh, it's insanity. If you're watching this somehow, if you even found this somehow, you should, right. you should be checking out the show. Oh, other favorite characters, though. I have. I could just keep going. Yeah. Um, let's, let's... Uh, my, my favorite character, honestly, I wish she had more time is Livia. I love Tony's mom. Like, truly love her. She's why I think the first uh, two seasons are the best. Um, she is at both comedic gold just the funniest character um but also like the the the, the darkest character the original and existential queen pin absolutely of the world. absolutely the the whole you know her and then junior and i i wish we got to see where they would have been able to take that and and they hint at you know he's gonna she's gonna turn on tony and this whole thing and um be a thorn in the side but i just love how complex she is she's a great actress you know you see her in those m- moments where she's she's is she pretending to be insane or isn't she pretending to be insane? And does she know? And you don't know. And you know, and I think it's a great depiction of older age. Once absolutely. you start to have uh, seniors in your life, you, you start to think, is this you? Is this your mood today? Mm-hmm. Are you going to be like this tomorrow? Yeah. Like, how much should I even dig in? Like, is this a moment you're going to remember even, right? Uh, which we, goes into Junior, too, and his whole portray- per, uh, uh, portrayal of age and what you see with him and his. You know, very I, impressive. Yeah, Junior's an impressive character too. Yeah, chip on his shoulder, always oh. got something to prove. Right, literally his name's Junior. You know what I mean? What the hell? Right, yeah, asking for it. Come on, don't you, name your kids Junior. Mm, you know, and, and 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 just the depth of just taking those two particular characters because I would say back to antagonists. Not that I'm gonna mess around, but those two were I think were early antagonists in the first season. It would be Junior and Livia, and they're you know, relationship. We've written some with some main DVD cover type characters. Let's oh, hit yeah. a couple weird characters, like side characters. Oh, man. I I'm going to start I, with please. Um, Matthew Bevilacqua in oh. Chippendale, whatever that guy's name is, like yes. the good-looking dude, yes. the beefy dude. Like two wannabes, basically, that are uh. somehow even more inept than Christopher. Like Christopher is supposed to be like the young man slash child of the show, like mm-hmm. learning the mafia ropes. 
But he definitely has like a place in the rank of the organization. They have no street sense. And it's so funny to see like what are basically mafia interns. <laughs> Truly. In this world. They start as interns. The first time you see them, they're interns for that financial thing. And they're wearing They are suits. literally interns. And yeah, you're so right. you're like, wait a minute. And then these two guys just come over and beat the hell out of that guy. And you're kind of like, wait, they're connected guys? They're not just working there, you know? Mm. And then it leads them into, um, again, spoilers. I had Bev Lockwa on here, but he's under my death because I thought his death, you know, he's a, I, I enjoyed his character a lot. He's, he's a great character. That, you that, enjoying that thing? Yeah. Because that sugarless motherfucker is the last one you're yeah. ever going to have. <laughs> ah, he's crying and he's crying. Oh, and it's just such a pathetic fucking death. He wants to be this hard ass guy. Uh, again, uh, not, you know, the deaths. I do like how. Every let's do some deaths. Let's jump sorry, from characters sorry. to deaths. No, sorry. let's go for it. Let's um, start, let's start ending because some so many before of the, we start them. So many of the characters their their whole thing is their death it's true right like is it's wrapped up in how they're dead or, or where they end up you know um just go bang act characters i don't okay. want to no, go screw around too much we'll get to deaths um uh i like hash a lot he's kind of a side character i really enjoy i really like hash being kind of the consigliere's consigliere right like you know sylvia uses his guy but hash is like the brains he's his jew right that's the thing he's like i got my jew right i love hash um Who's the other one? Oh, the detective. That was the one I want to talk about. Oh, yeah. I love detective at the beginning. Um, Vin, I can't remember his his full name. McKazian? Yeah, something like that. McKazian. Um, Vin McKay. Is that really his name? Vin McKazian? Vin, yeah, it was Detective Hilarious. Vin, and I, I didn't get his last name. Um, Kevin McAllister's dad, you know? That was the joke, because, you know, the dad from Home Alone, that's how he afforded his everything. It was, was the dad from Home Alone. Was, yeah, that is great. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's funny when media, too, is in context of other media. Oh, yeah. And Sopranos really didn't have any huge A-listers in the show. Like, they all made their name, Edie Falco. I the, guess the only one would be the other kind of awesome character, main character we haven't talked about, which is Silvio. Silvio Dante, Dante, yeah. Guitar player, Stevie Van Sant for Bruce Springsteen. I did have Ben Kingsley and Annette Benning on here because I loved that those two played themselves and were like, you see Annette Benning in that moment and you're like, that's Annette Benning. And then she's like, are you Annette Benning? And he, she's like, yeah, I'm Annette Benning. Because he's dreaming, right? There's that dream sequence with her. I One of my favorite parts. But yes, you're right. There is no um, big A-lister people here. They're, and the, it's interesting because they, they're all like, not cast offs but they're all in like goodfellas and casino and these it's like um he almost chose to do like like reflections of these other characters thank you for bringing that up they were not like public stars necessarily but they were in the like mafioso media consciousness yes because so many people had seen them in scorsese movies they were in the italian american pantheon of actors and and that that group of people right and yeah. he he kind of picked people that he'd already seen in things it seems like um we hit some good characters. And yeah, the yeah. characters are going to keep coming out even as we're talking about the themes. Pai oh my, great character. I love that horse. We got a horseman in the house. Animals. That's a great <laughs> theme. Yeah. Um, we got a horseman in the house. Um, I want to just hit one of my favorite themes of the show, which Please. come you know it's, people look at it as a family show, right? Oh, it's not just the mafia; it's a family show. But even beyond that, it's about um, multi generational family family dynamics, right? You mentioned Livia being Tony's mom. Then there's Tony. Than there's AJ. So it's always floating around at least three generations, which I think is one of the most accurate depictions of actual life, right? And any problem that you have, whether it's a monetary problem, um, maybe a problem with the stability of your family, whatever it may be, it has to do with the foundation that was created likely before you were born, right? Maybe the inheritance you, you did or did not receive or the debts that uh, accrued to your family. And a lot of shows struggle to do that. Obviously, they don't always have the, the foresight that they're going to be around for so long. And when you think about The Sopranos, wasn't even around that long. It was seven seasons. Mm -hmm. Six has 6A and 6B. Yeah. But in that time, I mean, AJ went from like an 11-year-old to a 21-year-old. Like he went from child to adult. Absolutely. So it's very, I don't know, it was very pointed in how they, they managed to point out how history can repeat itself, how history feeds itself, right? Mm. Uh I, I I love everything you're throwing down right now. Again, goes back to how interesting AJ is a character. If you take him at face value, it's like, oh, here's this whiny little bitch, rich kid. Bastard, but if yeah. you look at the Terrible. whole thing, you see the generational trauma that's kind of inflicted on him, and he is the sum of all of his parts. You know, he it's it's very interesting. You know, I feel like it was uh, David Chase deliberately chose to focus on him at the end when 
your focus that you're having big AJ episodes when there's three or four episodes left in the season and you have huge AJ episodes. And I was like, what is the point of this? It's like, he's showing you the epilogue. He's trying to show you the epilogue. So you get a sense of what this person is going to become, right? Like what is Tony Soprano's legacy? What is his family, the next generation of the Sopranos family going to be like, you know? Every time I watch it, I forget that he tries, AJ tries to whack himself, tries to off himself, whack off himself. <laughs> so close to the actual finale of the show. Yep, yep. And even in this most recent time, Matt actually, we, we sat together and watched the finale together mm -hmm. like a week ago. I noticed um, very specifically how they put AJ in the Tony robe for the finale. Like yep. they just straight up, you know, they, they talk about putting on, you know, your, your father's tie, whatever it may be. They put him in the same clothes. They basically most famously have Tony in the entire series, right? Like sort of... Um, Someone who is participating in the world, like he's he's there at the dinner table, like lunch table, whatever. But he's he's kind of kind of lethargic. He's kind of apathetic with with being there. Like he's not even fully dressed. He's not mm -hmm. fully making a statement as to who he is, who he wants to be, what matters to him. Yeah, he's showing up, but <clears throat> he's a little embarrassing. Yeah, right. And he's his father's son, right? He's just as as different as they are. He is. Tony Soprano's son, right? It's like he might not be as big and as tall. He might not, he, he couldn't whack his uncle for him, you know, but by God, he wears the robe. He wears the, the tidy whities or, you know, he is his father's son. Again, I forgot he did try to hit, do a hit. Yeah, he tries AJ to kill. AJ does try yeah. to kill someone. Yeah, and fails miserably, yeah. right? And he Which, gets out of it because it's, it's such a bullshit thing that he does. It's such a, uh, a weakness that they forgive him immediately, which I thought was great. Tony's able to get it resolved instantly because it's so pathetic everyone's like oh, yeah you know like which is more embarrassing in a way than like actually achieving what he was absolutely. trying to achieve it's like you're a non-factor yeah. okay in the law enforcement <laughs> this was really sad so we're gonna give you a pass because you know obviously it was attempted murder but it was a weak ass attempted murder so we're gonna let it we're gonna let it slide i i love how they did all that do you want any themes that, that come to your mind besides the multi-gen Oh man, I, I wrote down. You got a lot. Right? I did. I did write there, a lot. It's but, a rich text. But that's the thing. There's so many. So many. I wrote loyalty, family, death. I think is just one of the biggest overarching themes. Is like death. How you deal with death. How you deal with death in your, your every day. There's so many funerals. You know how it's just. It's fascinating how it just surrounds everybody in that show. You know, and they just live with this thing. Like there's there's a couple of scenes or moments where they they talk about people in the past who are missing, you know, and it's just like a fact of life that like huge chunks of their generational family is just missing, right? A lot of these these men who die in their 20s or go to jail, you know, I just think death is just, it, it's fascinating how they deal with it so much, right? And there's no real resolution. I don't think that they like, they don't like push any agendas with it. It's just here it is, right? Um, it's another thing the show was famous for is not providing resolution. The, the Russian and Pine Barrens is a famous example. Classic. Even between seasons one and two, I've heard David Chase talk about how they didn't expect, like, where is Big Pussy to be such a mystery? Because mm -hmm. they just had one of their friends, confidants, like, sort of disappear. And people went nuts for it. They loved it. It was like a marketing campaign Absolutely. or something. Like, what happened to Big Pussy? You know, it's like, who shot Mr. Burns <laughs> you know, eight years later? Um, that, that. And just another thing on death, because you're really, you're really smart for pointing that out. Please. Because what's the next show that comes on HBO after The Sopranos? Six Feet is Under. Six Feet Under, yeah. And that's nothing but funerals. Death. Right? They just literally like, God, these, these funeral scenes in The Sopranos are amazing. Let's just, just full go. Alan Ball's like, let's get in the funeral home. Let's just make this happen. It's just such a, it's, it's a thing we're all faced with, right? It's such a. It's the ultimate stake. Absolutely. You could lose money, but you can gain money. But if you lose your life... That's it. You're out of the game forever. You're done. You're done. Mm -hmm. And it's just the way it's portrayed in that show. Again, death. Again, I have a whole category that's just death, right? Um, so um, immigration, really quick, just more themes. Immigration. I love the Italian, uh, American, you know, them talking about it. Um, I love, like I just said earlier to you, how they talk about it in the first season being kind of, not caricature but, you know, it's like, hey, you, got, you know. And then in the second season, they straight up talk about it. It's like they all hear, like, what what the culture is saying about the show. And they're like, yeah, but this is it, right? This is how people grew up. You know, these are my relatives, blah, blah, blah. I just like how they kind of defend themselves in the show, but also elevate the conversation about um, immigration and being an Italian-American, you know. Um, crime, the American dream, 
you know, so much about it is American dream. Yeah. Uh, ties up integration. Consumer that, culture, capitalism. Capitalism, man. Like, this is before all the late capitalism memes that you see now. Mm -hmm. This is obviously at the turn of the millennium, people thinking about like, who are we as a nation? What will we be in the forthcoming millennium? Besides obviously paranoid about Y2K. Um, Man, whole other side. Um, Carmel keeping up with the Joneses, you know her her monetary thing. Um, big house, huge, huge house. suburban estate. Um, right. Her um, what is good, right? Which kind of goes into her thing. Like I'm, my money comes from evil, but I'm able to do good things with it. So is it okay that I'm doing these bad things? And her knowing that her money comes from, you know, not great places. You know, I I, I love that. She's she's another fascinating character. So on characters, man, you, you made me think of the priest. Oh, Intentanto. Uh, so Father, uh, what's, no, it's, uh, I love his name. Father Rigatoni. What's his yeah, name? no, it's, um, Mr. Intentola. Father Intentola. That's Is that his name? Yeah, I really Intentola. don't even know. Yeah, you can look, it's because it's such a, such a silly one, Father Intentola. It sounds right. Um, and them and their, their, you know, the chat, the chase. Phil Intentola. Yeah. 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 Father Phil. Father Phil. Father Phil. Yeah, they soften it a little because he tries to be like your friend. Uh -huh. He comes and watches a movie with you, uh, pops into DVD. Do you remember what movie they were watching? I'm trying to. Faith remember? of the Heart like or. On that night he some, stayed over yeah. and got too drunk. Anyway. And Sorry, got, Sopranos it, fans. We're not that deep on the trivia. Oh, but God. Father Phil. We're pretty deep. That's pretty deep. Uh, yeah. He's not a, a, like a main character like no. you won't see him on the dvd but good lord yeah. does he provide a lot of juice absolutely i love i love i love tony just shitting on him all the time you know uh, talking about eating his food and all that stuff she comes over are you hungry you know like just like the, the <laughs> subtle digs to him right um yeah that he's he's one of those characters that make it work right that is just a great side character um for tony to play off of you know what i mean um this is why it's the best show it's it's got everything it's got a little bit of everything. The loss of religion in America, the the, the rise of consumerism, right, and, and your economic ability to be the defining factor of you, especially as a man, mm. largely. Oh, yeah. You mentioned the immigration piece. I think it's also secretly the best show about immigrants. Yeah. And, and it's not so secret because even like the final DVD cover, there's like Ellis Island in the background. Made in America, final name of the final and episode. the last episode, Made in America. So they're kind of screaming it at you. Mm -hmm. This is an immigrant story. This is a true immigrant story, you know. Um, and I've actually developed this theory of America. I mean, not my theory necessarily, but I feel very strongly now that like America isn't even its own thing. Like to consider America being separate from anyone else to me is an illusion. It, it's like a trick America is pulling. It's like a marketing trick mm -hmm. because America is really a combination of every other country on Absolutely. earth. Always has been Absolutely. to some degree. Yeah. Colonists fr from England or other European countries, but... Which is interesting why, how now we have this whole like nativism streak in us and this whole nationalistic and, you know, yeah. but, which, you know, it's like these people are being sold a bill of goods that is just false. Because if you look at us and our favorite stories, our favorite cultural stories are usually stories about immigrants and people coming here and making them their, their way of the American dream, right? It's usually not people that are here. You're talking about Elf? Yeah. The movie Elf, Elf, the immigrant Elf moving. I'm talking about Superman, you know, like just just an alien coming. It's true, in. they're all. If you look at it, they're kind there's of immigrant so many, stories. There's anyway, so yeah. many immigrant stories of people coming to America through all these different ways, and them just figuring it out and making it here. Because if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. Yeah. New York, you know, whatever. Um, yeah. Sorry I, to throw Elf in there. It is December, so I wanted to throw a little Christmas vibe. Also, John Favreau, famously in The Sopranos. Oh man, right. And they even hilarious call, character in The right. Sopranos. And he's like again plays himself, right? Like <laughs> Christopher meets him, and like he, uh, it's such a great portrayal, right? I love when Christopher meets uh, a lot of the Hollywood insiders, and they just don't know what to do with Christopher because he's just himself. He's authentically Christopher. Yeah. And they just don't know how to deal with him, you know? Yeah, it does make you think like God. They portray Hollywood. And all the people that, that interact being such phonies. Yes. And well, one thing Christopher is not capable of is, is being, being phony. phony in a way, like his because he's such a hot rod. What does he, he call? Can't help it. What does he call him in the? Um, he does the. He's in the movie. Um, they're making the movie, and it's got Janine Garofalo, and they're the cops. Pukyak. Yeah, yeah. yeah I call he, him a Pukyak, you know. And, then, and they're like, okay, Pukyak, you know, and they love it, right? Uh, <laughs> David Chase uh, famously hated television, right? Um, that was some of the things that they were talking about. Was he did a show called like Nor Northern Exposure and some other shows um, on network television. So this show he made specifically to be kind of an fu to network television because he wanted it unfilmable for network. 
That's okay. Is that true? You, oh yeah, hundred hundred percent. In 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 the whole design of the show is it's it's relies upon that fact that each episode is in fact a mini movie. Yes. And I I can't think of many shows that did that before. This has to do in part because of network television. Even an hour show was maxed out at forty four minutes because mm-hmm. you had to pump all the commercials in there. But they had like the full 50, 55 minutes. Absolutely. They popularized that format and allowed you to tell what was kind of like a movie length story Absolutely. in just under an hour time. So I don't want to blame TikTok anymore for our short attention spans. I actually want to blame David Chase for taking what's at least an hour and a half movie and cramming it into 55 minutes every single week for The Sopranos. It's interesting the creative freedom, though, that gave him because it allowed him to not do stereotypical serialized show things, which like having to, 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 to answer questions you asked in the first episode. It's like, no, or in the episode before it. It's like, no, we're not going to do that. We're just going to pretend like it didn't happen. Or it, something did happen, but you'll never know about it because sometimes that's life. You know, he, he, it, so it, good. it allowed him to do so many things by treating them like a movie. You know, like instead of this serialized, everything has to connect in the next episode and everybody has to have an arc. And, you know, some people just are there and then they're gone, right? How about all Tony's Gumars, right? All of the women that he's with. How many of those characters? The Russian. The Russian chick, you know, the woman that kills herself. You know, the woman that mm. burns her face in the bacon grease. You know, so many Juliana Margulies, right? Like how many, like he just had so many just people that are in and out and then you just don't know, right? They're gone. He doesn't, it, it's like almost, not that they don't matter, but they don't matter, right? Like on to the next thing, you know? Well, it's kind of a consumerist culture thing because he consumes food like a drug. He consumes uh, women and people, food. you know, like they're consumables and dis- discar- discardable. Um Obviously, the man has an appetite. It's and truly, I, unfil- like absolute. I love it. The last shot, oh, I got onion rings for the table, and he's eating an onion ring. Right, yeah. even at the end, he's still eating a food. You know, he's just food in the show. It's just, I mean, that's. Well, you see, the onion ring is a deep fried <laughs> representation of the earth. It is this, a perfectly round f- figure. The circle of his story coming to full closure. Exactly. Aurora Boros, you know, like. <laughs> mm. Uh, Tony has no more to say, David Chase, same story. So he wanted to put put us at rest, put us at ease by showing him scarfing onion rings. Oh, man, yeah. It, it, the, the food, the eating, the consuming. You know, he's constantly a consumer of, of everything. You know, he, he doesn't stop. Here's the thing, though. It is a reflection of America. In, you know, 20th, 21st century America, we have sort of lost our original identity, which was as a very clearly immigration nation, where, like, you were... You know, half a military veteran, maybe from World War One, World War Two, but you're also half Italian, half Irish, half whatever. So you had basically two different pots to draw from. From like, what kind of day is it today? Am I an American today, or am I going to be more old school Irish, whatever? And then you stick to that. Now we've kind of lost, especially newer, <clears throat> excuse me, um, white Americans who have been here for longer, multiple generations. They've lost like the ethnic piece. Yep. They're like their original national identity and now we're just left with america we're yeah. just left with the onion rings and the cars right the escalade the burger, and, and the yeah. big home consumerism and we don't know what to put in the home anymore Mm-mm. as right. americans what what is our cultural traditions right that's what they're all built on to the point he, he is such an identity crisis that literally the whole show is based on him going to therapy because he cannot he cannot well, mark it, 25 minutes at least, and we haven't talked about the therapy I yet. was just thinking about that. Unbelievable. I was like, well, the one th- the one theme that I didn't, I just left off was mental health. That yeah. was the one theme that I had, st- we stopped at death or whatever, but then mental health. But yes, literally, has, he's struggling to, 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 to rectify his identity. You know, he can't. With with being being a being a twenty first century man with panic attacks and anxiety and normal feelings and this old school guy who's got to provide for his family and do the thing and do the job and be in business right he can't he can't put those two together you know he's trying right I think that's the only pleasure he had was introducing Furio to Carmela's life and turning himself into a cuck <laughs> yeah right you know, to, to oh get a little God. little stimulation a little sexual excitement Ugh. from. Uh, the tension that arose from her eyes wandering to another alpha male, uh, right? And again, Furio just poof gone. You know, he's know just gone. You know, he's in Italy. He never shows back up. So you know, it's like, it's it's you know, again, unresolved kind of. You know, like his his whole another great character. I love I love Furio. You know, you know, if if I was 
when I was when I watched it like in college with my buddies, like Furio was the man back then. Okay, like just, when you're just full of fucking testosterone, twenty years old, you just like want someone kicking the door down, taking names. Oh, and then he again, Matt uh, Matt ba- uh, Pavlakwa. Who who would have thought he would been somebody we've m- brought up multiple times? But when Furio goes and like gets his cut from him and goes, yeah, and you owe me another thousand dollars. Just and he hits him, down. Some, shakes him down again, and then he because know, he knows he's kind of a little bitch. He wants to play the game. Okay, give me a thousand dollars. And then he does, and he leaves. He just like fuck him, you know. Melfi though, Doctor Melfi, oh, just, just the therapy scenes, unbelievable. Obviously, this ties into his prescription. You know, getting Prozac, which is the SSRI yeah. life we're living now. With, or a lot of people, I'm not on Absolutely. SSRIs. But Absolutely, a lot of folk obviously integrate that into their daily. But such smart thinking that they can get these talk scenes. They can allow him basically to voice his inner dialogue through conversation with uh, a loving, like, female Italian character. Uh, sort of like bringing out the mother, bringing out the wife. But that's, and then that's the thing. They don't even sugarcoat it. They go there. They're like, yeah, because I'm like your mom, right? And that's, you know, you kind of want to do me because I remind you of your mom. And I'm a little withholding and all this stuff. You know, like they, they it allows them to go deeper into his psyche you know it allows him to to really and and <clears throat> as the audience you know you're able to kind of be her in a way you know where you can you can be enamored by him you know and you can see the inside workings of him and like you can see why she's so attracted to him and why she he's so charismatic right so you kind of get it but also you know that he is full of shit right like there's so much of it you want to believe him but then he'll just murder some guy, you know, like yeah. Yeah. Well, college. That's one of the episodes I put on the first when he goes to Meadow with college and he sees that guy that's a that's a former rat informer. And it's that back and forth where they find each other. And it's like, well, is he going to kill him or is he going to let him live? And at the end, he just kills him. And you're like, ah, oh, Tony, like, you know, he chooses to do the bad thing. Right. Like, so you see that. When he's with Melfi all the time, he presents himself as this victim, victim, victim. But it's like, come on, man. Like, I love how you can see it. Right. Like you can you can. You can see it, you know? He's in there every week blabbering to her, putting on a show for her just like we watch, you know, through the, through the actual show itself. Them getting to the end, though, about I love her her, her kind of the end of her arc realizing, you know, um, Peter Bogdanovich. I can't remember his name. The doctor, her doctor, who's kind of just a smug, you know, jerk Elliot. off to her. Elliot, yeah. Who, who, who just, he knows that Tony, he just not as attracted to Tony. He sees Tony as a scumbag and he sees it very from, from a different perspective. And, you know, them going back and getting her to realize, like, yeah, he's a sociopath and you are just helping him do this. So you need to leave, you know? Um, the fact that they're, yeah, hitting, like, enabling someone, even in the mental health profession, yeah. that late in the show, considering they started the show with mental health professionals like is, is pretty amazing that they went full circle on psychiatry yes like oh it, it could get to a point where it's not even helpful for you anymore you know like the show kind of like debunks psychiatry almost in a way or like at least for that personality type at least for that personality type but even in general well look at carmela she goes and you can tell she would get a lot out of therapy but she can't face it right the guy you know she goes to see that guy he's like i'm gonna take your blood money because i'm not gonna take your money but if you want to this is what you're gonna do and you got to break the cycle and blah 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 it you was could, Especially you know. highlighted when they went to different therapists, because some of them would play ball and some of them would not. I love that. AJ with his therapist at the end, you know, like, yes, yes, yeah. The one that was with Meadow that basically, like, was trying to be the cool therapist, like, well, if your parents think you want a little freedom, maybe you should go to Europe next year. Maybe you should do that. And it's like, oh, my God, if you look hard enough, you're just going to find anyone, regardless of their level of education, who are going to, like, say yes to your bad ideas, assuming you're paying or assuming someone is paying. Right, and right? that's, again, capitalism, right? You pay enough person, even a doctor that's supposed to help you, they will just give you what you want, right? Like, it's, it's, oh, man, it's it's such a, um, it's just so smart, yeah. right? It's just so smart. Yeah. I, you know, the layers of layers of layers, you know? In a mob show, go on. Not just a mob show, right? Not just a mob show. Yeah, I, I, truly, I cannot believe we went half an hour without talking about the mental health piece. Oh, man, and, and she's such a great actress. I think it's cool, too. You know, I've, I've gone back and seen a lot of these um, uh, retrospectives and, and the cast getting together, and they, it's funny because she's like, they're like, we really don't know her. <laughs> she got to go for like two days a week, shoot with just, you know, uh, James Gandolfini, and then that's it. She doesn't really interact very much with like Christopher Moltisanti or Silvio Dante, you know, any of these other characters, right? But she is such a huge, integral part of the show. But it's like she's on an island unto herself almost, you know, Dr. Mm. Melfi. Mm. Um, 
Yeah, and she's she's just one of the better characters. She's so complex. And too. she also simultaneously uh, shows the version of Italian American that uh, ascended to the working or the not the working class, the the white collar in society, right? Just like uh, his neighbor Cusimano. Yeah, like they're Cus. they're and they're both doctors. Yes, and they that's famously how they were connected. Like Cusimano, Tony's rich doctor who lives next to him because he lives in this palace in, mm-hmm. the, in like this nice suburb, recommended Melfi and. You start to see how once Italians got to this country, there was ways in which th- you know they made different choices and splintered toward taking different positions, even sometimes based on where they're from. They kind of talk about in the show the people southern or yeah. from Sicily. Did you want to integrate into America, or did you want to make your own like little Italy and your own kind of chunk out of it? Right. Yeah. You know, I- something that it's like still happening, especially living in a city like Chicago. There's so much segregation. You see how someone can. You know, move to River North or or North Center. I don't know. Yeah, but, uh, or sticking with your own community. You or, know, or stick in the, an ethnic you know, community. Right. Like, I want to move over here because that's where my people are and I'm going to jive better with them. You know what I mean? Like, I'm going to... That's my people, right? Like, I'm also obsessed with the, the dream sequence stuff. You mentioned dreams. Oh, I love it. I, I love am it. so yeah. obsessed with, with the... I, I've gotten more into the art of, like, film craft or... Obviously, the writing stuff with Christopher and JT, his friend, mm-hmm. super funny. You know, oh. the, the, his writer that's in A, uh, and then producing Cleaver together, yeah. super funny. But the dream stuff is so so interesting. I, I don't think any show has done dream stuff that well, pretty much ever. Mm-hmm. I know David Chase loves David Lynch and mm. uh, Luis Bunuel. He's like a Spanish director okay. that he stole out of not stole used properly identified. What is it, great artist steal. Right, and you, you thank you properly identified and used some of the dream elements with but i just want to like watch the dream stuff from the sopranos constantly i'm uh, obsessed with the subconscious now at this age you have yeah. enough information oh, God, to totally. know that even if you have more data it doesn't mean you have more truth necessarily that reality is more about perception than it is about objectivity right uh, the uh, episode the second season episode i have down here is night in white satin armor and that's the episode where Tony dreams that big pussy's the fish, and he has the big dream sequence where he's under, he's got uh, the flu. Um, he has the food poisoning. And that is one of my favorite. There's the two. I love that episode. And then the one at the end where Steve Buscemi's entering him into the, the house, and everyone's in the house. And he's like, I don't know if I want to go in there. Right? Nine White Satin Armor. Isn't that a fun house? Is Fun House the one? Oh, maybe I'm wrong. There, I think I, they're right next to each other. I thought it was the second End to of last episode. Two. I thought it was the second, the penultimate episode is when he realizes that big pussy is the. Or is it three episodes deep? I'm sorry, I might have got. It doesn't the matter. It doesn't matter. I just. But that's the one where the fish talks. You know, I'm the informant, Tony, and he has the thi- and it just like comes to him, and he has these constant. You know, I, I I love it. I love it that you know when he's taking the ride with all the people that he killed recently, like Ralphie's in there, big pussies in there with them. You know, like, you know, um, Steve Buscemi's driving. Tony, Tony, what's his last name? Blendetto. Um, Tony Uncle Tony Uncle Junior Tony Uncle uh, I can't remember what the joke is Tony so. Uncle Al yeah Tony Uncle Al yeah there something it is. like that um, unbelievable yeah they, they basically express through Tony's dreams they show you his dreams that people live on in your mind even after they die oh yeah right which is a way to the heaviness the guilt all this thing you think you don't have any guilt for these things that you've done but it's like now you're dreaming about him constantly so you got some feelings about it you know what i mean yeah. like you can't just murder your cousin ralphie and chop him up into bits with your cousin over a horse and not feel something about it you know what i mean can't slice up the pie like that when he's when he's dreaming again going back to dr melfi and he has a dream towards the end where he basically says yeah i murdered my cousin and i murdered this person and you don't know you're dreaming and you're like oh, finally he like comes clean to her about it and you know they both know but then it's like he wakes up and dreams and then you watch him do it again but he hides it from her when he's in there it's so hard because it's like the easiest thing to overuse because dreams are kind of they're fantasies yeah and so it allow you to amplify what you show on screen and it's the easiest thing just every episode just throw some dynamite on the screen and then you can just kind of take it back you know you kind of blow things up tony revealing he's a murderer yeah but then be like, nah, he was just considering that. Just, 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 nah, dream. he was just, just dreaming, just dreaming. Like, oh. But it's like he wants to to do these things, you know. You know, he just wants to. Dreams about sleeping with Doctor Melfi, right? On more than one occasion, like, you know, it's 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 interesting the way they they do that, where they make it really dreamlike, and then they make it totally like reality, but then it's not. 
you know. They show Melfi dreams too, don't they? They did. Do well, they show her The first the time, they actually, I think that's it. He sleeps with her once in a dream, but the first one is is she's dreaming about sleeping with him. And he has a she, car accident. Yeah. The, we're out of the woods, we're out of yes. the woods. Yes. That's yeah, Wizard of Oz. Oh my God, I forgot about that line. Yeah. Music, we could talk music for hours in the show. I think music is super fascinating in the show. Yeah. Um, yeah, they the choices that they they've make and David Chase very rock and roll. Mm -hmm. You know, picked a lot of old classics, and does it? He chooses songs sometimes that you wouldn't think for certain things that you're like, that's a weird choice, but it it like works. I don't know. Oh, I, it became very famous. Yeah, like like the Tommy James and the Shondells, Crystal Blue Persuasion mm -hmm. on Breaking Bad, where they yes. like, they're cooking meth to like basically kill people, but they're like, playing like this happy go lucky type shit. Like, people people have stolen that's people have stolen that right. Let's choose. Squ a, Squ Squ says he did do that. It's true. That's did, true. You know, yeah, it, it's great, something great I, you know, you can't give David Chase full credit no. for that, but yeah, you're right. especially considering a lot of times these projects, to my understanding, are limited by their budgetary constraints. You like, can't get certain songs. They want to just play the Stones or the every, Beatles for all sorts every of shit, time, yeah. but you have to find ways to yeah, prove that point on budget. Yeah. Um, Lots there, of great music, though. Yeah, yeah. Except for the end song, I hate Don't Stop Believing, I won't even lie. I mean, it's fine for that moment. It still bothers the, you? The f finale. Yeah, I just don't like Journey. I never liked that song either. Yeah. It's, it just... It belongs to the Sopranos now. Yeah, but me. it fits. It fits. It fits in that moment and the, and the whole thing. And I get, I get, you know, it's it's almost we're almost wrapping it up. Anyways, ending. How do you feel about the ending of the show? Um, what do you what do you feel about it? Like it, it being the the way it wraps up, the way it concludes. Like, see, I I I almost can't even go there. If you if you're making me like say an opinion, which you are, I guess, by asking. I, I love it. I love sure. what they did. I love the fact that he was able to still, in the last episode of the last season, mm -hmm. innovate. Mm -hmm. Show a, a way of storytelling um, that ends up being unfulfilling. But that is kind of a trademark of the show yeah. is you don't have to have the closing of the loop every time. Right. That's what the onion ring's for. Uh. Eat the onion ring. You don't need the physical loop. You have the onion ring loop. I was going to have, uh, my hot take is, um, is he alive? Is he dead? I think it doesn't matter. My and hot he, take is it doesn't matter. And he's alive in AJ. Right. Now <laughs> AJ's a baby Tony. Yes. So what does it even matter whether he was shot or not? Well, time out. Some people think that the whole family got whacked at the end there, which I, I can't get down with that. Like the idea that like they don't touch families, right? Well, that's but like the idea is like the like it's the Sopranos. Like so, at the end, all of the Sopranos are dead. But I can't. I don't think that that's you know. And Meadow comes in. Am I late? Yeah. Am I late? She just gunned down in the doorway. <laughs> but actually, I tell you what, no, it's not true because we, as we talked about last week, uh, David Chase did that car commercial with AJ and Meadow, and apparently that is in the Sopranos universe. So, like, they're technically alive. So that right there says that they're not dead, right? But where are they going? But anyways, I, I, think, I think to your point, it doesn't matter if they're alive or dead. It's, it's unfulfilling because that's kind of how life is. Tony's story, for all intents and purposes, is over. Whether he's alive or dead, it, it doesn't matter. His story is over, and that's it. You know, like, we were on this ride with him. But even if he doesn't, you know, dead or alive, you see what's happening. Somebody's turned on him. He's going to do the jail time that he's always avoided finally, you know. Um, you know, his family is pretty much together, even though it's kind of a mess. You know, they all show up at the diner at the end. So, you know, I, it's really, it's as close to the American dream as you can come. Getting, right. getting slain in a diner shortly after eating an onion ring. That's as close <laughs> as you can come to success in America in the, the modern day. The onion ring. That's the fact that he even lived that long mm -mm. at his size, which unfortunately in real life he did pass. I know. Which that's a whole other, um, interesting part of let's this. let's do a little art imitating life yeah let's okay. do a little bit of that we have to hit all the important stuff we only yeah. got like 10 minutes left so but, just do yeah so art imitating life it's fascinating now going back and him passing the show and now being somebody who didn't get those middle years where he was live and talking about it everyone talking about how the absence of him it's very interesting watching it and then him not around to talk about it it felt like tony really died right like, yeah you know it feels like he died died you know it's really weird um, James Gandolfini was an amazing, from all, from all you can hear, and like, he's an amazing actor, right? Like, I, we are, we are, we are, we are. You think? I don't know. Was Gandolfini, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> we should end this being like, was, Gan was, he, was good? he good? At was Gandolfini good in this? We've, we've all had a disservice by him not being able to like do more things. I feel like his second or third act, whatever you want to call it, where he hit that movie that would have gotten him the Oscar and all that, like I think we we missed it. He could have had Ozempic, got skinny, <laughs> done like a Matthew McConaughey Dallas Buyers Club thing. Uh, totally, right? Yeah. Uh, but anyways, I just think it's it's crazy the him not being around and, and it's just a huge absence. 
other art imitating life type stuff. Yes, please. Um, very recently, like yesterday, actually, I just found out that Michael Imperioli, who plays Christopher, just opened a bar with his wife. Really? Yeah. Wild. And he opens Crazy Horse with Adriana in the show. Oh my God. But then I was like reading about this and I guess he had a bar from 1995 on. Okay. So they might have based the Christopher Adriana opening a bar thing off of Imperioli for real. So his full- And he's still doing it now. His like, intro thing in Godfather, he was the bartender, right? He was the bartender in the Godfather that got, gets gets killed, right? Um, uh, also art imitating life with him. He was a writer on the show, which I was fond of recently. He wrote a couple of episodes of the show. Which is like he was a screenwriter, did Son of Sam, which was a great movie at the time. Yes. And which at the time it's a great movie, but like he wrote for the show. So it's like really weird that then. And they have him as a wannabe, as Christopher, you know, wanting to go to Hollywood, having those Hollywood pipe dreams. It is time. so meta before it was meta, right? Um, it's crazy. Them talking straight up about The Godfather. I, I love that they just reference Godfather, Goodfellas, all of it right in there, you know? It's the definition of postmodern, you know, like talking about everything that's happened, like this is the end of history, not mm -hmm. realizing that you are perpetrating history. Oh my God, oh, becoming yeah. history, becoming classics. Literally 50, 60 years from now, people are gonna talk about Sopranos the way they talk about, you know, if if we continue and, you know, television, culture, whatever, Sopranos is gonna be one of those ones like- So we Sopranos, Coco Melon, <laughs> what's gonna survive, basically. Please God. <laughs> um, did you want to do recasting? I think that's a fascinating topic. If you want to quickly, I if do, you had some, I'd love to. That's a little please. lighter, and then we can end on some more high flute, yeah, 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 type stuff. I was just trying to think. I obviously don't want this to be remade. Yeah, it still holds up. You could watch this right now and love it. There's not a lot of mm -hmm. technology that aged poorly. No. Obviously, human nature is something that, that goes on. Yeah, I love the timeless nature of it. But just for fun, I came up with basically two different casts. Okay, of Sopranos. Um, I guess I'll start with the one that's more, I don't know, funny. Or yeah. like, I assume how the only famous person in The Sopranos was Silvio. Yes, was a yes. famous musician. So that was my inspiration for the first cast. Uh, I think if we could get Aubrey Graham, if we can get Drake a little fatter, I think we could have Drake as a fat Tony Soprano. Really? I think we could get him. I think uh, Zendaya could be Carmella. Okay. I'm also picking stars. I want this to succeed. This is, yeah. This, this is some hipster this is, shit. I want this to be the number one show on TV again. It seems that this cast, though, you're not going to do the Italian mafia, though. You know what I mean? It's like a different mafia oh, I think, adjacent. Or, or you, no, I gonna, think, no, yeah, the modern take should be that they're like uh, Eritrean immigrants or something perfect. from 20 years ago. So perfect. it's like the Eritrean immigrant story as opposed to the Italian American. Love it. Just bump down the road 20, yeah. 30 years, right? Uh, we could have Future as mm -hmm. Polly Walnuts. Oh, my gosh. You're really going for it. Okay, I love it. I love it. <laughs> like kind of like a funnier yeah. type character. A lot of musician weird. people. A lot of musicians. I mean, and this is just like a yeah, almost. I'm into it. And then um, this is just ridiculous. But Silvio, we need someone the most famous musician type. Let's let's put Kanye West in <laughs> Silvio. I thought you were gonna possible. say The Weekend or something like that. Um, Silvio has the weird jaw. The Weekend will be great. Uh huh. I yeah. Think the Weekend. Who would he be though? He'd have to be. Uh, he'd have to be Big Pussy or something. They think so. He's all about sex. Yeah, that's true. Big pussy. Yeah, puss? I mean, his name. Yeah, big puss. Um, big if weekend. I, if I did, I'd, I'd go another way. If uh, we're gonna do like musicians, whatever, I'd, I'd say Tony would be uh, Jack Black would be a great Tony Soprano. Oh fuck yeah, that's you real. Know? That's real. That's yeah, just that's like do, do another angle on it. You know, if you want to do like a comedy bent, I think he'd be great. You could do like uh, Sarah, Sarah Sorry, Silverman as like uh, Carmela. She'd be a good Carmela. <laughs> um, you know, I'm I'm trying to do comedians, thinking like the comedians. You know. <laughs> um, I dig it. I'm, I'm trying to think of who I... Let's throw Jimmy Kimmel in there as... No, uh, no. That he was Bobby Bacala. Someone. Bobby Bacala. You know, he'd be perfect. He's got kind of the same head shape. We'll put a fat suit on him too. Mm -hmm. uh, who, who is the funniest character on The Sopranos, do you think? Like, uh, it's... He, to me, it's uh, Christopher and, mm. and Polly Walnuts. Okay. For sure. I, I would agree. Yeah, those are two two laugh out louds. I really think Junior is hilarious, though. Mm. I like Junior's his anger and his like he just throws it out there. I think he's got some of the best best one liners. I see. I'm still 34. Yeah. You ask me when I'm 44, 54. Then, I'll say Junior. I'll all get older, it a little bit more. All the older characters. I just love all the older characters. Yeah. He's um, like their Mr. Burns. <laughs> you know, he gets to throw in all these anachronisms and all this. At the end, when he's like, you know, you were the king of uh, New Jersey. That's nice. You know, that's one of my favorite lines yeah. where he's got the no teeth and he's yeah. just there. And, and and again, he survives, right? Junior survives everything. Um, I'm going to do a more serious cast with people who are more serious actors. Okay. Uh, Jeremy Allen White. 
Oh, wow. The guy from The Bear as a younger Tony. Okay. Let's maybe start. We can even redo an actual Soprano okay. style, a more Italian style. Yeah. Maybe we can start where he knocks off the card game. Okay. Where he actually starts to Ooh, ascend. Yeah. Jeremy Allen White, I think, would be age appropriate for that. Yeah, he'd uh, be cool. Florence Pugh as Carmella. <sighs> great. Great. Right? She's great. Right. Got the short hair. Maybe that's part of what's. Yeah, what's, no, what's no, but even the facial structure. She's kind of tinier, blonde. I think she could really pull that off. She's great, dude. Yeah. I mean, Edie Falco. That that cannot. It's really hard to redo that. But Florence Pugh is iconic. Solid. Uh, and then I thought, who was funny for Christopher? Uh-huh. Also age appropriate, whatever. I was, maybe Theo Vaughn. Oh. Could Theo Vaughn be like? Could have like a more of a country? Oh God, Christopher. He doesn't. Theo doesn't have the depth, right? Like, there's a there, well, well he doesn't have the right. I, yeah, that's he true. Have to actually, be like Imperial. That's Ellen. true. He's too like that non sequitur funny. You know what I mean? And I, uh, I just don't think uh, you know uh, Christopher's got an anger to him that I think Theo Vaughn does not have that streak where he's going to beat his girlfriend. Adrian okay, Hyatt. he needs more of an edge. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. if, if 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 I would think more like, um, oh my god, got to be young though. A lot of famous people are. Older. Kieran Culkin, from fuck, that's good. Kieran Culkin, I think he'd be great. Great yeah, that's pretty right? good. You know, like yeah. you could see him, like he's got that, you know, um, you know, yeah, kind of like the baby face, but that you could see him like losing it on somebody real easy. Okay, um, I did that. He's a little old, but I'll, is he? Yeah, he's a little old. You know, because it's got to be twenty something. Older. I don't even actually know how old he is. Uh, and then, Timothy Chardonnay. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I almost put him as like a joke for some character, but he's yeah. so small. It, yeah, he, 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 he couldn't he fit the the shoulder pads. He couldn't he'd pad be, enough shoulders. He'd to be make Benny. It. He'd be Benny. You know the the side guy, or he would be um, Be- Bevilacqua. Third time's a charm, Bevilacqua. Uh, last person in that: Jeremy Allen White, Florence Pugh, Theo Vaughn, I, Charlie D'Amelio as Adriana. Oh, just just yeah. to throw some TikTok fame in Perfect. there. Perfect, because I picked all like. I think more I think Zendaya, Zendaya would be great in the in the show in some capacity. I really do. She's a, I think she's a great actress. You yeah. know, and you I don't really watch a lot of Euphoria, but like that's. Probably got the HBO contacts. That there you go. Should, shouldn't be too hard. She's 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 at that that high performance thing. But anyways, yeah, we are within full striking distance of this episode ending. Yes, sir. I don't want to say you should stop believing. <laughs> don't stop believing, but um, we got to come up with whatever is le- whatever encapsulates your thoughts of The Sopranos. What are the final things? Why you do that? I'm gonna quickly just go through some things. Um, some of the most famous shows that came after The Sopranos, Mad Men, Boardwalk Empire, were direct descendants. Matthew Weiner, one of the writers on Sopranos. Mm-hmm. You're tearing it up. Yeah. <laughs> Doing a little Craig Ferguson here and just going to tear up the cards at the end, you know? Not to mention, I mentioned shows like Breaking Bad that obviously pulled a lot of tools out of that belt. Yeah. The, you know, the the anti-hero character, the, one, the dude who's like a dick that you still are somehow rooting for yeah. a- after seeing them do all these atrocities. Seeing many saints in New York come back recently, the mm, show. Like, yeah. con- I don't want to say Sopranos is falling prey to the franchise culture and media we live in, but they kind of are. I mean, David Chase, you know, you, you think he could make a movie about anything at this point, but his next feature film, he might have done one, but since The Sopranos ends up being a Sopranos world thing, yeah. you know, they end up using that. Uh, what else? What else do we have to hit before the end here? No, I think I think you're pretty much summing it up. The cultural impact of the show is is forever going to be vast. I think um, it's funny to say this, but I think all shows now are kind of under the shadow of The Sopranos. You know, let's end on that. Soprano syndrome. It, it's it's every show is 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 trying to hit that cultural impact, right? The the closest I think we've seen, but it didn't stick the landing, was probably Game of Thrones, another HBO show. I mean, Breaking Bad too, but the heights, you know, everybody was watching Sopranos, the the the, the thing. Just like uh, I feel like Game of Thrones, but obviously the ending for Game of Thrones was dog shit. But like trying to be so culturally impactful, must see TV where everybody's watching it. You know, that's one thing that I think throughout all of this, there's so much stuff, but it was fucking popular, man. Everybody watched it, you know. It wasn't like this was like one of these things where only certain select people understood or got it, dude. Everybody was watching the show, you know. And I think that hard to unify people. It's so hard to unify people. And and again, this was at like again, it was a sweet spot right at the end of like before the internet exploded and 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 everything kind of like. Everyone's um, in their own world now, splintering yeah. interests, right? Like, we could all agree on what we saw at the Bada Bing. Yeah. We could all uh, get down with what we saw. Yeah, I just I just think, uh, for me, it, it's all shows I watch now will, will, will be, you know, I will compare it to Sopranos. It's probably the best show, I think, 
um, of the 20th century. And that's the syndrome is like loving the show and appreciating the show, but not letting it, you know, cast that huge shadow. No, I, you almost can't watch anything else. Like, that's where I'm at right now. I'm trying I, to figure out what to what to do next with my life because it's such a hole. You know, literally, boom, fade to black, and that's what it feels like. I'm I'm empty. You know, because you're following these family, this families, people, and you're engaged, and then it's just gone. And now it's like, what do you do? But it's again, it's funny because you have felt this feeling for years, right? You've you've felt the absence of the Sopranos. It's been over, you know. So you just get to go back and. I think one more genius thing about the ending, I'll say at the end of this ending, is that because they didn't show Tony's bloodshed, yes, because it kind of lives in your head. In a way, it makes it easier to rewatch. I think when you see a main title character getting slain at the very end, in a way, it's a signal that this is the end of this story. Time spent focusing on this person is wasted time versus the most rewatchable movies. I love like Kubrick movies, whatever it yeah. may be. They don't always give you full resolution on your ending, which make it, I think, much easier to watch because you're always asking more questions. You're always searching for meaning. Even if you know like they're artfully showing a death, you don't actually see it. And on some level, that trick is genius. I, that you don't close the door. You can keep walking into the house over and over and over again. Absolutely. I think that is genius. I think that's a great, that's a great finale. Yep. Last tiny little question, oh, just for fun. I mentioned Christmas was coming up. It's going to end on a light note, not the, the door to hell being permanently ajar. Um, Christmas gifts that Tony received. Would you rather receive a big mouth Billy Bass or that French hat was it a fedora kind oh my of, god he had that silly that? hat yeah that silly hat it was <laughs> like a this fez. age it was like a fez, kind of, right? no, a fez is the cone one yeah it was would you rather that french hat he got from meadow uh-huh. or would you rather a big mouth billy bass um i don't know probably the hat in my life but no the billy bass just to throw that up on the wall and just just see that you're going with the bass i guess so right yeah the bass yeah. How about you? You know what I really want? I want a pie am I. I want a horse. I want a horse. <laughs> I, I, want, I want a freaking horse. You want a pony for Christmas is what you're getting at? Please. Can I have a pony? That, okay. Well, uh, ho hopefully Santa's watching. Yeah. Bye, Cheers everyone. Thanks Thank for watching. You.